have Professor Van Gogh. He is going to speak about synergy between, between temozolamide and individualized multimodal immunotherapy to improve overall survival of IDH1 wild type promoter or unmethylated GBM patients. So, thank you, Professor Van Gogh. Okay, I hope you can see the slides. Yes, we can see them. Me. Great. Uh, so, indeed, um, it is um, our uh, honor to present you uh, some exciting results that we have observed in uh, this year, so to say. Um, glioblastoma uh, should be discussed in the International Week of Brain Cancer, uh, which is actually this week. So um, it's, a, it's a topic which is uh, world recognized. And still, of course, the major challenge, uh, not improving really, uh, because the standard of care has been published first in 2005 and then again in 2009. And everybody meanwhile knows that uh, the combination of temozolomid together with the radiotherapy and after the radiotherapy can ultimately improve the median overall survival from 12 months to 14.6 months with a little bit longer long-term uh, overall survival for a very few number of patients. That's the standard of care not being really improved over the last years. In 2009, um, new data became available from Stuck and colleagues. And I want to mention already uh, a discussion point, which is also uh, maybe important for Dr. Arroyo in uh, doing randomized clinical trials. You, of course, have to stratify within randomization. And it is very remarkable that the original study has been uh, stratified according to the WHO performance, uh, the extent of resection and the treatment center, while the data in 2009 has been presented with an other type of stratification being the RPA classification, which is a clinical risk score depending on the grade of the tumor, the extent of resection, the age of the patient, the Karnofsky performance index, the minimental status, and the quality of the radiotherapy. And here for the GBMs, there are the RPA class 3, class 4, and class 5 patients showing the benefits of the addition of temozolomid to the radiotherapy in the three groups, but of course, much less prominent in the uh, more severe clinical risk profiles. Besides that, I think in a retrospective analysis in the same study, it became clear that the MGMT promoter methylation status is in fact a very strong a determinating factor which should be taken into account in novel studies with uh, the stratification. As you see here, temozolomid works much better in combination with the radiotherapy as compared to this group of patients, the MGMT promoter unmethylated patients, where already the radiotherapy in red on its own works less good than here in the MGMT promoter methylated patients. My talk will focus on this and I will come back at the end on this curve, so really the worst patients. Now, it's not good at all and people have tried to add new um, treatment modalities to the new standard of care, surgery, radiochemotherapy, and maintenance chemotherapy. And the fields where I have been active for the last 20 years is the addition of dendritic cell vaccines for uh, patients with glioblastoma. And there are many phase one and phase two trials already published. The greenest ones are contributions 
from my own research group. And based on this phase one and phase two trials, meta-analyses have already been published showing that for long-term overall survival, the effects in the positive way of the addition of dendritic cell vaccines gives a significant improvement of this long-term overall survival without the addition of extra these patients with a very bad prognosis. So for the dendritic cell vaccines, where are we now at the level of evidence defined by the Oxford criteria of evidence-based medicine? As I have said, we have several systematic reviews at the moment available of cohort studies, phase one and phase two trials. But there is even more. Indeed, we do not have a pivotal individual randomized clinical trial because the stratifications are so complex at the moment that it is simply not feasible. And certainly we have also no level one evidence of systematic reviews of randomized clinical trials because they even do not exist today, the genetic cells for GBM. But we have a level 1c evidence in the all or non situation already exemplified by the first patient that has been treated in Europe by our group in 2001 and published in 2004, but still alive in 2021, a relapsed GBM after two times neurosurgery two times radiotherapy and 18 months chemotherapy, treated with new resection, having a transient flare up as an immune reaction and being in complete remission, not for four years, but meanwhile for 20 years. So everybody is convinced that such patient will die. And if you come with a new treatment modality and the patient survives, this is an all or non situation showing the highest level of evidence. Now, we have tried to do randomized clinical trials and we have, as all the others, failed because the stratification for the control group is too difficult to make it in an appropriate way. But in this trial, in this uh, report on the randomized clinical trial, we have shown the influence of the peripheral immune system on the ultimate prognosis of the patient. But what came also is that patients who were treated in a late vaccination arm had always a little bit better two-year overall survival as compared to patients who were in an early vaccination. Early vaccination means surgery, radio chemotherapy, vaccine, maintenance chemotherapy with vaccines, while here the placebos were given. Primary redox was at progression-free survival after six thymosolomid cycles. And then, because of ethical reasons, these patients also received vaccines after all the chemotherapy. So it means, ultimately, this patient group won. So it's logic to place, in fact, the dendritic cells more after the chemotherapy than during the chemotherapy. But then, of course, we have the problem that we have, in fact, a very weak tumor control only with thomasromid maintenance chemotherapy during about six months. And therefore, we had to think on the addition of something extra already during period, during this period, which makes, of course, our treatment schedule and our treatment strategy quite complex. As you can see here, we have to give radiotherapy and chemotherapy as an anti-cancer strategy. But that's not enough. So therefore, we have thought to add the oncolytic viruses, Newcastle's virus, 
and modulated electrohyperthermia already during the chemotherapy for the induction, not only for genetic disturbances due to alkylating agents, but also for the induction of immunogenic cell death with release of antigenic extracellular microvesicles so that the immune system over the dendritic cells becomes already aware that something very strange is happening here so that the dendritic cells can move to the lymph nodes to become a mature dendritic cell and present the tumor antigens and the viral antigens to the lymph to the lymph cells, the um, T cells, which become activated and which can move to the tumor site to fight against the cancer, eventually modulated with the um, checkpoint inhibitors. So therefore, what I have already said this morning, we can now combine the chemotherapy with immunogenic cell that approaches, we use the combination of oncolytic virus and uh, modulated hyperthermia quite shortly after the chemotherapy, so that this biological process can happen in the interval till the next chemotherapy is starting, followed by the next immunogenic cell death treatment. And after all the chemotherapy, we can isolate monocytes change them towards immature dendritic cells, load them with tumor antigens or derived from the tumor lysis or derived from extracellular microvesicles and apoptotic bodies that are isolated after the immunogenic cell death therapy. We can mature these dendritic cells and we get a mature dendritic cell vaccine presenting the tumor antigens and the viral antigens this vaccine is again injected intradermally. The dendritic cells move to the lymph nodes, similar as here. They stimulate the T cells, and the T cells can fight against the cancer, eventually helped with immunomodulatory strategies. That's our combination, which we have done and already published in 2018. So the strategy is surgery, radiochemotherapy, thermosolomy blocks now strengthened with immunogenic cell death therapy. After all the chemotherapy, we give the two dendritic cell vaccines. Each vaccine cycle is consisting of a blood sampling to isolate the monocytes, immunogenic cell death therapies for five days. Then the blood is taken to uh, yield the antigenic extracellular microvesicles and apoptotic bodies. And then at day eight, the vaccine is injected in combination with another session of oncolytic virus injections and modulated electrohyperthermia. Three weeks later, we do it again a boost vaccine, again, eight days ICD treatment, and at the end, a vaccine. And then as we have already mentioned also this morning and discussed, we start again with these immunogenic cell death therapies in maintenance. And we think we have quite good reasons for that, which I will explain in some slides further. This strategy has been given to patients here at the IOZK. I have frozen the data bank at a certain time point. I have looked to the records. I have very carefully selected GBM patients, excluded the younger ones and the very old ones, the IDH1 mutations, which are secondary GBMs, the diffuse midline gliomas, second malignancies. So we end up with 74 adults with primary GBM treated in first line. Um, from 32 of these patients, I have a documented status of NGNT promoter unmitigation therapy as part of the first line treatment. So we discuss in total 32 patients. And we have learned two elements in this observation it's a retrospective analysis. First of all, is this observation. We have followed the circulating tumor cells 
and the messenger RNA expression of several oncogenes, NGMT and PDL1, over the time in these circulating tumor cells. The extent of expression of the messenger RNA is depicted in this color scheme. And to keep it very simply, you can see that the colors are changing over time in each patient, and it might go quite fast already in the first months. That means that we are looking to dynamic tumor processes. So a tumor does not remain the same type over the whole treatment period, which makes every protocol medicine difficult because if we look to such a model and the direction of the roads is changing, then nobody will drive the car like a protocol because you will crash, that's a relapse. And then you can use a second line treatment, but you will crash again. And that's your death maybe. So we have to develop systems that we turn the wheel or the treatment within time, which makes, of course, randomized clinical trials with protocol very, very inappropriate for such a dynamic tumors. So I have already mentioned the certifications. I've already mentioned the ethical issues in the race to overall survival. There are certainly um, issues on GLP, GTP, GMP, GCP and costs, but also the tumor and the host dynamics should be taken into account. So therefore our question, can we use fixed treatment protocols for highly dynamic cancers in permanently changing biological contexts? My answer is no. What is then my solution? My solution is that we have to do repetitive liquid biopsies to follow very closely in which direction the tumor is going. But we have also to treat and heal the modulated electrohypothermia can play a very important role. Because if we keep going on with maintenance immunogenic cell death therapies, we keep going on by killing tumor cells and at the same time including potential new antigens in the immune protection umbrella that we have already installed with the vaccines. So I think one extra argument to keep the modulated electrohypothermia is to take into account changing tumor subclones, killing them and immunizing and getting them in the global immune protection. Of course, we eventually can consider repetitive active specific immunotherapies and we should all think on changing and always adapting modulatory immunotherapies with these patients. So maybe you can start with modulated electrohypothermia, but at a certain time point, it might become important to add a checkpoint inhibitor to have your effect uh, much better there. That's the first observation which we have done. The second observation is that we have patients in the treatment one group, and patients in a treatment two group. The patients of treatment one group have said, Timozolomit will not work with me, so why should I take it? Then we have said, okay, if you want, we can give immediately the modulated electro, the, the uh, immunotherapy as we usually do. Other patients have said, I take the standard of care, surgery, radio chemotherapy, maintenance chemotherapy, which we strengthened with the immunogenic cell death therapy, followed by the uh, vaccine strategy. So seven patients, 25 patients here, we had one lost of follow-up. If we see now the characteristics of these patients, group one versus group two, there is no significant difference in the age and the Karnofsky performance scale, so two major factors of the RPA classification, 
also no difference in the extent of surgery. The base blood values and immune values are also not different between both groups. The relative proportion in circulating tumor cells negative or positive but without PDL1 or positive but with PDL1 is also not significantly different between both groups. The number of vaccines and number of dendritic cells given not significant between both groups. The number of Ucalsis virus injections and sessions of modulated electrohyperthermia are different between these and these because these patients already got ICD treatment during the dimsolamid, while these did only receive, of course, the ICD therapy in maintenance after the vaccine cycles. What do we see in overall survival curve? So the most clear readout is overall survival. We see the blue line from group one, and we see the green line from group two, which is, although the numbers are quite small, which is already highly significant. If we now put these data in the perspective of the Stuck data of 2009, then we see that surgery plus radiotherapy had a median overall survival of 11.8 months. For sure, addition of immunotherapy on its own did not add any benefit for these patients. We know the significance of the trial. As I have said, I came back to this curve. This is the curve. The gain with timozolomid in this patient group, half of the patients live longer for less than one month. The median survival goes from 11.8 to 12.6. Significant, yes. Relevant, no. However, if we now look to these data, we see that the median overall survival jumps from 11.8 months to 22.07 months with a 36% two-year overall survival. While this on its own does not work, while timosolomid on its own has no relevant effect, I think the combination of both is really significant and relevant. Therefore, we came to the title Synergy between Timosolomid and Individualized Multimodal Immunotherapy to improve overall survival in IDH1 wild type MGMT promoter unmethylated GBM patients. We have submitted, of course, this data, and the reviewer um, wrote this is a really interesting clinical study. So I hope after answering the reviewer's questions, we get that published. In conclusion, now we have surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy as primary anti-cancer agents. We can use targeted therapies or targeted immunotherapies like, for instance, CAR T cells as anti-cancer treatments. We have now also the biology treatments with Newcastle disease virus, but certainly also the physical treatments with modulated electrohyperthermia or tumor treating fields. It's another modality. They all act as an anti-cancer agent, but they can induce already some immune protection treatment-induced anti-cancer immunization. In very rare patients, that's enough to keep the control over the tumor. But in GPM patients, mostly it's not enough. So we have to add something extra. We have to become active and give active specific immunotherapy with vaccines, and we have eventually to modulate this immunization with immunomodulatory strategies. So I'm completely against the use of only checkpoint inhibitors in combination with anti-cancer agents because that will never work. We should be aware that we speak about tumors and holes 
that are permanently changing and also their interactions are permanently changing. We should be aware that these patients usually take a lot of other drugs which might influence this complex biological system. We should choose and keep choosing the smart combinations within the dynamics and on a very individualized way so that we hopefully can improve our cure of uh, GBM and at least the survival chances for the GBM. That means uh, when we conclude that individualized multimodal immunotherapy should, in our view, be integrated within the standard of care first-line treatment for patients. And that, unfortunately, old-fashioned randomized clinical trials do not seem very appropriate for such highly dynamic biological processes. As uh, Dr. Mena has moved into the direction, we did the same. We have also uh, put a, pro a, a focus on prolongation of life and good quality of life. And there are now the European quality of life um, scale available, five dimensions, five levels, translated, I think, in 32 languages over whole Europe, which is a very easy tool to use to measure the quality of life and to calculate the CALIS, as uh, Dr. Miller has also done. So our current optimal scenario is that we have the standard of care in black. We can add immunogenic cell death therapy. We propose to make immune diagnostics already after the radiochemotherapy so that we certainly can add immunogenic cell death therapy during the maintenance chemotherapy. We would propose to be active as well, as I have explained, by giving two DC vaccination cycles with modulatory immunotherapy, monitoring the effect and how the immune system and the tumor has changed, and starting the immunogenic cell that maintenance immunotherapy together with the modulatory immunotherapy, which can then be continued. I have written some here in green and others in red. Because I think we have now almost the ethical obligation for collaboration within this strategy. I think we can share data and we can give the immunogenic cell death therapy done by all the hyperthermia centers that are connected in this talk. Everybody can do this. Not everybody has an dendritic cell available as an approved advanced clinical trial, uh, advanced, um, advanced therapy medicinal product that we have. So if we collaborate in treating the patients, we can expand our patient numbers very fast, make the appropriate observations at this time point, so that eventually at the latest point, we can start thinking on designing clinical trials. But if we can already share data and the patient can here come for immune diagnostics, so this would be also a patient here at the IOZK, so that means we can share data. And then, of course, each collaborating center owns the own data, but we can also then deliver anonymized data of all the patients that are in such a consortium treated together. And of course, if we get nice results, we would also invite all the centers that collaborate in this such a strategy to be co-authored on common publications. So that would in fact be our dream within the society, how we can move the field forward for these patients with in fact still a very bad prognosis. And I thank my team to, um, to help us here in this work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Van Gogh. Your lecture is, is wonderful as, as always. And I think what you say is really interesting. And um, from my part, I appreciate uh, the, the option to collaborate because I think uh, that is the, the main thing uh, here because 
you are the expert on this part. We, we can do other, part, other things in different centers, but to join efforts, I think, is, is the main thing. So from my point of view, I am really open to, to try to collaborate and, and join efforts because I think it's, it's really, really important to move forward. And I think this treatment can be really a, a great challenge for patients with a high-grade gliomas. So thank you for that. And I would like to ask you uh, only one thing. Uh, do you think that, uh, or, or what, what do you think is the appropriate schedule for the patients when you are in the part of the maintenance treatment with ICD? For example, uh, do you think that is good uh, going on with a modulated electrohyperthermia? I don't know twice a week between your treatments or what do you think is the best? Well, we would propose to see the patient after the radiochemotherapy, um, just to have the baseline there. And then um, the, the maintenance stimulus together with the uh, hyperthermia can be done at the local place because that is much more accessible for, for the patients, um, we can discuss on the mode of application of the modulated electrohyperthermia. So as said, we do that at day 8 to day 12 after each timosomid cycle with the chemotherapy at day 1 to day 5. But of course, this, this can be discussed. Then after all the chemotherapy, the patient is invited at the ISFK in Köln for these two eight-day vaccination cycles. And then about three weeks after these two eight-day vaccination cycles, we would do here again an immune monitoring to compare with the first blood sampling that we have done after radiochemotherapy, and then to give here the first maintenance um, immunogenic cell therapy because then the patient is here and then the patient can be followed up further by the local center where the maintenance hyperthermia has to be given and then because in, in this way we can do that without big without big formalities because if we share patients at both sides that means that we can share without violating the privacy of the patient, we can share the data of these patients. But we can, at the same time, sample the data from all the collaborative centers, so that the whole collaborating group can profit from all the data. Having their own data in perspective of the anonymized total data, and sharing within uh, the total group for co-authorships for publications. So I think this is in fact a pragmatic, clinically driven organization that is, let's say, feasible this afternoon to install. Yeah, yeah I, I think so. I agree that I think it's a great idea. Yeah, and I, I have another question. If when you have, for example, patients who are not candidates for chemotherapy with GBM because they already had temozolamide or bevacizumab or something, do you treat the, the patient uh, in monotherapy with the vaccines and, and your treatment? But do you think uh, combining with maybe low dose temozolamide or maybe with full dose temozolamide to see if the combination works because maybe at the beginning it didn't work, but maybe if you join the passing plus temozolamide, mm -hmm. maybe you can have good results. So do you have any idea about that? Yes, so in the rescue patients, so the patients at time of relapse, there are, there are many possibilities. So um, if it's a late relapse, some uh, standard of care oncologists uh, want to reinstall tibosolomate. And then we jump in tibosolomate plus ICD afterwards vaccines. Other oncologists use a second line treatment, the CCNU or the fotemustin, as, as you have mentioned, where we again can connect the ICD treatment with vaccine afterwards. 
Other groups uh, go to avastin or rigorafenib, um, which can immediately be combined with full vaccination strategy. Then we don't have the period with the ICD. Um, if you give a second line avastin plus irinotecan each 14 days, then we can add each two weeks the ICD, but then I would postpone the diabetic cell vaccines till after all the irinotecan. If the doctor um, has no standard of care second line treatment proposal, what we usually do then is the installation of peripheral alcohol inhalations as an anti-cancer treatment that goes through the nose directly into the brain. So you pass the blood brain barrier and you do not disrupt your systemic immunization. So we can combine the new alcohol inhalations with full vaccination strategies. So there is a whole scala of uh, second line treatments that should be individualized, designed. Our strategy is always to try to take into account what the standard oncology proposes as second line and how we then can plug in on an individual basis. Okay. So thank you so much for, for your comments. I think it's, it's wonderful your presentation.